the goal for today is to, to take about an hour to do this webinar. My hope is that it can be a bit more interactive. I'll, I'll have some places where I've thought maybe questions could be appropriate. And so I'll just open it up to you folks at that point there. Um, as I said, the idea is today to have a bit more of a practical discussion. Um, but also I want to, you know, for those of you who were perhaps not there, I want to give a little bit of a summary of uh, existential analysis at the beginning and of acceptance as well so that we know it a little bit experientially. The, the nice thing about acceptance, and for that matter, about the work of existential analysis is that we in some ways know it because it is meant to connect with our experience. Um, it's meant to feel like in some ways coming home and giving experience or giving words to experience um, that we in some ways know already. And so my hope is that for, for those of you who are, who are participating in this, or for all of us who are participating is, in some ways what, what I'll be saying today will be a recognition, kind of a remembering of what we already actually know in some ways. Before I go too much further, um, let me just say a brief thank you. So you heard me talking with Julia. Julia is the person locally in London who is organizing this webinar. So thank you so much, Julia and to the GLE in the UK for having me. I'm, I'm hopeful that this will be something that will be beneficial to you and beneficial to your training there. The idea for these, these webinars and for this meeting today as well is to help prepare and provide an opportunity for uh, an actual existential analysis training program that's gonna be there. And towards that end, you have the, the kind of the opportunity for a fully embodied experience of existential analysis when Alfred Lengler comes to London um, on uh, February 23rd of this year. Um, and we'll be having kind of an introductory seminar to the main ideas, the main content of existential analysis. And so that's coming up on February 23rd. You can check, I think, the website for the, the GLE and the UK website. You could connect also easily. So you, you see somebody's name, Julia, here, Morozova. Julia is the one who's organizing it. So you can feel free to connect with her as well. Um, and, uh, and they can get you connected in terms of registering for that event there. So that's happening on February 23rd, really all day from 10 o'clock until the evening then. Um, and just an, a brief uh, plug as well for an upcoming uh, beginning of the idea, uh, the beginning of the cohort, of the next cohort uh, in, of, the, of existential analysis in the UK. That is meant to start in May of 2019. So you have a few more of these kind of web-based things. Then you have an intro seminar in February and then the whole thing or the start of the cohort, hopefully in May of 2019 there. So that's, I think, the announcements that I want to want to say at this point. Um, just a few words about myself. You, you may have seen them on the announcement. Um, let me just say a few things, just kind of to introduce myself personally, rather than just through the words that are there in the announcement there. So my name is Derek Clausen, as you can see from, from the little uh, icon above. Um, I'm a professor in counseling psychology for the last almost 10 years now uh, at a small liberal arts college just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. So I'm a, I'm a Canadian there, although I grew up in Germany. So I grew up speaking mainly German, actually, for the first 16 years of my life, 18 years of my life, and then came to Canada to go to university. I did my training all here in British Columbia um, and uh, had an opportunity to get to know Alfred Lengle back in 2001 um, and then was, was so drawn, really drawn towards existential analysis so, uh, and, and wanted to find a way while I was doing my doctoral studies to, uh, to have the training here as well. So found and brought together a group of 20 people who initially started the first cohort here. And so we have now, we're in our sixth and then potentially even our seventh cohort here in, in Canada with potentials for starting up in the next province over there. Um, for those of you who haven't had an experience in that, for me, um, I'll just maybe say a few words just briefly about the training. It was a um, very, very moving and actually quite for me life-changing 
experience to participate in the training there. Um, it, uh, the, the thing I love perhaps the most about existential analysis is, is that, that it's not just merely kind of a tool that you take up and use at and with and for clients, but it's something that you can begin to embody um, and so it has relevance to your own life, to your daily life, to my relationships with my friends and my family, uh, to my relationships with my children there. So it's not just something that is there that can be used with clients only. And this is part of the reason why the training is lengthy, um, is long. The first several years of the training, first two years of the training, really we begin to understand and take in the experience or the, the, the material that is presented phenomenologically. That is, we, we ground it in our own experience. We come to know ourselves much more so. Um, and so it, it helps immensely when you then try and apply it later on that you have that experience, have already had that experience with yourself and that you work through the material in relation to yourself and you know it much more so than if you just used it as a tool um, as something that you apply to somebody else, but you don't know from your own experience. There. So that's my, my, my personal plug for that. We started the training here back in 2006. We continue to have it. We started in 2012 aboard in our own society of existential analysis. And so I, I remain active in that. And I have for the first time this year, have the opportunity to join two other colleagues of mine who were starting a training program, very similar to what you're trying to do in the UK here uh, in Vancouver as well. So I'm going to be coming involved as a trainer there. To give you just kind of an overview, I think that's probably all that I'll say about myself. If you have questions later on, feel free to ask them as well. Um, let me give you just kind of an overview of where I'm hoping we can go today. Um, I, it was a bit difficult and to know where to, <laughs> how much you already know about existential analysis, but I thought I wanted to take the opportunity just to provide a few glimpses, maybe for 10 minutes only, to talk a bit about existential analysis and to talk about our central construct or our central idea, which is that idea of inner consent. So I'll start with that and we'll talk a bit more about inner uh, in acceptance, which is really a form of inner consent. It's it's. It's a part of inner consent. And so I'll talk a bit about what we mean with acceptance so that we can get onto the, the page, kind of the same page together. And then I want to think about it practically with us because acceptance, especially in situations that are difficult, is not just simply something you can do. It, it generally requires a process. If we experience an inner no, there's a reason for that. And so to help people come to acceptance, it's helpful to look at what is needed for it or the prerequisites for it. And we'll talk about three of those, which are protection and space, and then also the experience of ground or being supported there. And so we'll talk about that. And then I have uh, in a clinical example from my own work there. I should say, just as an aside, that in addition to being a university professor, I'm also clinically active. Uh, in the community have been for the last uh, 10 years or so in working with uh, individuals who are recovering from serious physical illnesses or accidents there. And so the case that I'll bring to us and that I'll recruit your assistance in, in thinking about and how can we help this person is, a, is of a 69-year-old woman um, that I worked with for, for quite some time um, who suffered a traumatic brain injury and really struggled with coming to terms and with accepting the fact that her life was now limited because of this injury there. And so that will be kind of the end. And my hope is that that shall bring us to about one hour. So let's talk a bit about existential analysis to kind of, for those of you, and, and this will be the main content of what Eiflit will bring there. And so I'm, I'm, I certainly don't have any sense that it's just going to be overlap too much there. That I'll just give a brief introduction to it. Um, for those of you who, who don't know about existential analysis, maybe just a brief connection can be that you, you may have heard of the work of Viktor Frankl. So Frankl was an Austrian psychiatrist, lived from 1905 to 1997. So, uh, and, and Frankl was a, a Jewish uh, physician and Jewish psychologist 
an, a neurologist who worked actively in Vienna, um, went into several concentration camps, was freed from, from the Dachau concentration camp in southern Germany in 1945, lost several members of his family in different concentration camps there, and, and wrote, uh, and actually prior to, even prior to the, the World War, was beginning to write um, and was interested in helping people find meaning. And so this was his main aim in the work that he did. Um, and uh, in fact, his, his therapy, he ended up calling it logotherapy. And logos in Greek means meaning there. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I, uh, Victor Frankl's main aim and, and work with his logotherapy that he kind of kept up until, until his death was trying to help people find meaning there. And for, for Frankl, finding meaning meant kind of being able to understand yourself as being questioned by life, rather than as being the one who asks questions. He said we need to perform kind of a Copernican turn, a turn where we become the person who is being questioned by life, rather than the one who is questioning life. And so this he saw essential if we wanted to bring the topic of meaning into psychotherapy there. And then Alfred Lengler, whom you will get to know or have gotten to know, already worked very closely with Frankl for 10 years. And Alfred uh, kind of elaborated on the work that Frankl had done. Um, he elaborated in a variety of different ways, but one of the significant contributions was to help people see that it's not just simply in big situations that we ask can see ourselves being questioned by life, that it relates only to meaning, but life can question us. We can understand as being ourselves as being questioned by life really in any situation. So if you take yourself, just as an example, right now you take yourselves here in this situation, the, the situation that you are, you are sitting in front of a computer right now and you have an opportunity of hearing me talk, of interacting a little bit. And the question that you, have that is being asked at the kind of the first level to you is can you be here in this situation and if you can give your yes to it if you can give your yes to this situation you it means that yes i can be here initially and i can give my at this level inner consent to that and that was really alfred's main contribution to uh, existential analysis or to, to, to logotherapy, which then became known, more known as existential analysis, was this idea of this inner felt yes, this yes to my situation, that I am being asked by life in every situation, in every moment of, can you be here? Can you, do you like to be here? Can you be there with your whole self, with who you are as a person? And will it lead to something good there? And so this, this idea of inner consent of our kind of active participation in our life becomes central or is central to existential analysis. And so inner consent then is an active, it's a felt, it's not just a cognitive yes, but it's a yes that kind of arises within me that I feel. And then I give my yes to it. I give my conscious deciding presence, yes, present yes, to that what is arising within me. So it's a bit paradoxical in that it is, requires both kind of a receiving and a listening moment within myself, that where I pay attention to what is coming up within me, to my feelings, which I don't decide about, they simply come, and to my situation, which also I have limited capacity to control. Um, and then I am invited or I have the opportunity to give actually my personal yes to the situation. And that's what we mean with inner consent. And the result of living a life with inner consent is, is a life of engagement, of dedication, of me not just being part passively involved in life happening to me, but it means that I am actively involved in my life. That I am in this kind of dialogue, dialogue with life asking me and me responding on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, you know? And so it can be as simple as getting up in the morning or having a cup of coffee or being in a webinar like this, 
that each one of these situations is really an existential situation, a situation that asks me, how is it for me? How do I want to be involved with this? Can I be involved with this? Do I like this? And so forth. And it leads us, when we look at inner consent, it leads to this fourfold structure that Alfred Lengel has outlined, what we would call the structural model. That inner consent, when we look at it more closely, relates to my relating to the world, to the facticity of my life, the fact that I'm here in my body with my level of intelligence, with my limitations, with my uh, affordances and capacities. It also relates, and that, that will really, that relationship, that inner consent to, the, to what is, to the facticity of life, that becomes then our theme for today around acceptance. But there's three other levels as well. Um, one relating to life itself. So it's not just simply factual that I'm here, but there's a quality of dimension to life that I'm being asked, do I like this? If I can be here, do I actually like being here. So this relates to my engagement with my emotions. It relates to my, my engagement with my relationships as well. It relates then also thirdly to myself, to who I am and may I be who I am. Do I know first of all who I am and then can I be and may I be who the person who I actually am really that I can realize or actualize my existence. And then finally, it relates to the final dim dimension, which was, this was the Frankl's dimension, which is to the future or towards meaning, towards meaning to fulfill, which is the, the question of if I continue behaving in this way, if I continue going along this path, will it lead to a good outcome? Can I foresee that this is good? And do I sense that this is good and that good will come from it? So this is that final dimension of meaning. So if we then kind of turn from this overview of existential analysis, this very brief summary of the structural model to that of acceptance. Um, just to review a little bit with what we mean here. So acceptance, as I said before, relates to that first level, to that level that I relate to my world, to the facticity of my world, to those things which remain relatively unchanging, to my body, to the givens of my existence. Heidegger talked about this as being thrown. We are thrown into, into life, into our existence. And uh, the, at, at the first level, if I can give acceptance to that thrownness, so to speak, if I can give my yes, that inner yes, to the fact that I am here, then I have the experience of I can be here. And this is really, this could be a summary statement for what we mean by acceptance. And it has a few different elements. It has that element of I, that I am here, that I, I'm not just here in a passive way, but I have the sense that I can be here. I can take up space here, that whatever my surroundings are, they allow me to be here. When, I, when I'm in a, in a situation where I'm overwhelmed or I am threatened, where my physical life is in danger, I don't have the sense that I can be here. In fact, I have a very clear, no, you cannot be here. Get yourself to a place of safety. And this is true emotionally as well, that I may be in relationships that tell me I cannot be here. And we, the classic experience of that, the sense that I cannot be here is that of anxiety. And if, especially if I feel overwhelmed with anxiety, if I am traumatized in relationships or traumatized um, in experiences, that tells me very profoundly, no, you cannot be here. Get yourself to a place of safety there. So it begins with my, my existence begins with the fact that I am here, that I'm here in this world, that my being is, is a contextualized being as Heidegger spoke. And so the question that comes up for me then in relation to that is how is this for me? Can I be here, there? And so if I have the sense that I can be here, then I can give my active, my free, my personal yes to this question, that yes, I can be here. And so acceptance in this way is like a primordial ability. It's the ability of being. 
that I can give my yes to my being and that it supports me, that I have this experience of being supported by life and being supported by my, the conditions in which I am here. And so why is a yes needed? What, you know, why can't I just simply, I'm there, but why do I need to respond? Well, if I understand myself as being questioned by life, questioned by the world, by these conditions in which I exist, I have the possibility of being actively involved in them, that I'm not just simply this passive recipient and victim of my circumstances, but now I step in actively. I become active in my world. I relate actively to myself and to these givens. And I'm there. I become more present in my life. I become more present in my own life, my relationship to myself and to the things that are given to me. And I become more active in relation to what is there outside of me. And so I become, I have the sense that I am really there in my own life. I'm actually present there. Now, the challenge that comes for us in relation to acceptance is if we have experiences where we experience instead of this inner yes to yes, I can be here, rather where we experience something like, no, I can't be here. I, I, I don't have the capacity to actually be in this situation. And so then in these situations, acceptance becomes a challenge for me. Um, it may be something like an illness or a loss of a relationship or a failure or some kind of limitation that I face. The case that I'm going to be talking about in a bit relates to somebody who had a traumatic brain injury and had this, this injury had profound ex effects on her experience. And what this person, and I call her Mary, what Mary experienced at the beginning of therapy especially was a profound no. I cannot be here with this brain injury. It doesn't let me be. And so I can't let it be. You know? And so the question then becomes, how can we help? What is, are there things that we can do that make it easier, that may build our own capacity? Because if, if being really is a capacity, then there may be things that I can actually do to facilitate that. And so that's my aim. That's my hope that we can kind of look at some of those. And there's a few different ways we can go. Um, but the, 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 the kind of the next steps where I'm wanting to go is to talk a little bit about the prerequisites. Because acceptance is not, it's not something that I can simply do by willpower. I can do a certain amount of it by willpower. But if I have in my experience, this profound sense of, no, I cannot be here, then as a therapist, that's really important information for me and information that I need to respect. And I can come to kind of accept, so to speak, that person's non-acceptance, the fact that they are telling me, I know I actually I cannot be here. And so, so as a therapist, then the question is, well, where do I go? Do I just... You know, do I just kind of say, okay, well, whenever you can accept and come back to me, or maybe there are some things that I can do within the context of our therapeutic relationship, or for that matter, in relation to my own life or the lives of other people, where I can facilitate some of that acceptance. And so that's what I'm wanting to go into next and to talk a little bit about the prerequisites. What do we need that will facilitate acceptance? And that then becomes for us in therapy, the areas where we can become actively involved, where we can say, okay, maybe there's an area where we could look at and we can perhaps make a difference in our relationships therapeutically. And then of course, in outside the therapy as well, where the client, the, the world of the client, where they may be active there. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm going to go next to talk about those three things um, but before, and then talk a bit about the clinical example. I may go over a little bit. I'm just noticing that I hope that that's okay. We started a bit late, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can, um, yeah, that it would be okay that we go over just a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's, okay, it's no thank problem. you. Thank you, Julia. But maybe what, what I'll do is at this point, I've talked now for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes by myself here. 
Um, but just open up the, the opportunity for those of you who would like to ask a question about what I've said maybe so far about existential analysis or about inner consent or what I've said so far about uh, acceptance there. So just I'll, I'll pause at this point and just see if there's anyone who has a question. If you do, that's, that's great, but if you don't, that's fine also. So. Uh, actually, we have a question. My husband is here. Um, who, who is this, please? J Julia? This, yeah, it's, yeah, it's me and my husband, Nia. But no and you have a question on behalf of your husband? Yes. yes. Oh, very good. Wonderful. Please do. His name is Pavel. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, hi there. Yeah, hi. Uh, Pablo? Pablo. 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 Okay. Very good. Uh, uh, the question uh, from, uh, from me, uh, you said that uh, uh, regarding acceptance, uh, you need yes. to uh, ask uh, the world uh, why, uh, why, why, why am I here? Why, why, why am I uh, in this situation? What the world and life wants from me in this mm -hmm. situation? Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, when, for example, you are in some difficult situation, yes. you can have, you, you can have a, a real uh, polyphony in your head. Yes, and, there could be many and, things that are coming at you. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, how better to structure, how, be, how, how what is the way to find the right uh, answer uh, here? When there's many things that are happening simultaneously, when you feel kind of overwhelmed yeah. there, there's so many questions that are coming at you there. Yeah, that's a very good, that's a very good question. I, in my experience, I mean, let me just clarify one thing. When you said at the beginning, the why question, the why question is not quite so much the question here, but the question more is, can I be in this situation? Can I be here right now? Is it possible for me? Do I have the ability? And when we look at ability, it kind of relates both to my own strength, my own capacity, but also to the world. So I, I have kind of a dual view there. Um, but even with that, even if I clarify that question, it may still be that it's overwhelming for you there um and it there may be many questions that are coming at you um for me I, i'll speak for me personally when i experience that there may be some things that i do that are helpful for me to kind of calm me a little bit um i i talk frequently and clients speak about this as well to come to somebody who is where i can feel like i can be who i am in that relationship um, and where I experience acceptance of the other, the other accepting me, who I am, including in my overwhelmed state, especially if there's been a crisis in my life. You know, oftentimes clients need to come in and need to talk about this in order to even to understand what is being asked of them. So or, waiting, that, or waiting for the special sign. Or waiting for a special sign. Yeah, I mean, that may be the case as well. The, you know, but it, it, I, I find that it, if you can take up dialogue with yourself and to simply allow whatever question is that is coming up in you to be there rather than judging it or uh, saying this may not be part of that question, that you can kind of in this way begin to practice acceptance for the fact that right now I'm, I'm confused. There's so many questions coming at me and I don't know which one is even the right one there. Um, and so if I can begin to allow that, that maybe makes a bit more space within myself for those questions. There. So I, I hope I've understood you there. Okay, yeah, th 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 thanks, thanks a lot, it's very helpful. Yeah, you're welcome, you're welcome. Any other questions who are there, from people who are there, just about what I've said so far? If you do, just unmute your microphone and, and feel free. Just tell us your name, if you would, and then speak up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nobody there right now for a question? Hello. Um, Hello, Natalia. Yes, it's me. Yes. Um, I would like to ask you, actually, this is the question I wanted to ask um, also uh, Professor Langley. Yes. Uh, what is the time, what is the normal time of acceptance from your experience? Okay. Because <laughs> we don't have this in any book and um, how to know, how to know yeah. 
am how I to know? still um, how to say am I still <coughs> in time or I'm too late? Uh, so something like this. Mm, yeah, sure. It's it, it. That is a very good question. I do not know if we have a. <laughs> I mean, because part of the reason for that is, I think it's very difficult to give you a general answer in relation to that because it. Uh, simply the fact that you are unique and your situation are unique is unique and whatever situation you face is it, it's you uniquely facing a unique situation there and so i don't i don't have a clear answer in the sense of how long should it take right but i, I guess i hear a little bit behind the question is perhaps is is it normal to to take a long period of time to come to a place where we accept um, ourselves. Yes, yes, or this is true. Yeah. 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 Then am I kind of, so the question may be more, am I abnormal in that it takes me so long to accept this situation? Um, and, and so it will depend a little bit in me, my experience on the situation. Like there are some situations that are so difficult, that are so tragic and, and horrific that I may never come to a place where I can accept them. I, I'm thinking of a colleague of mine, a, a former student of mine, um, Tammy, uh, who, who lost her daughter in a car accident. And whenever this theme she, of acceptance comes up, uh, she responds very strongly. She says, no, it's, I, I could not, I cannot. When I talk with bereaved parents, parents who have lost children, they can't come to that place of accepting. Now, it, 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 it may not be possible to come to that, but it may be, if we look at our, ourselves and our own situation, there may be things that we can do in terms of some of the prerequisites for it that may make it a little bit easier there. The, the clinical case that I'm presenting, now it took, hmm, it took a good year year and a half of work to come to a place of accepting there, um, in part because it was a fairly complex case um, and uh, it was a fairly complex situation there. So it's, it's hard to give you a general answer there, but I think that if, you, if we, as we go into it, some of the prerequisites, it may make it a bit clearer for you, uh, Natalia, that, yeah, so, I'm, I'm hoping that that can be helpful there. Good. Any other questions that are here? Someone with the courage to ask. Um, I have a question, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Who is this, please? Um, this is Harriet. Okay, Harriet. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it was just a kind of follow on really from what the, the previous person was asking and you were saying about how there are some situations that people find so kind of difficult or traumatic that they don't feel like acceptance is ever going to be a possibility. Um, yeah. I work with um, patients with cancer um, and yes. counseling psychologist as well. And um, I work with patients with cancer and it yeah it can often be to the word acceptance can often be yes. too difficult and I just wondered whether you ever re rephrase it or use a yeah, different terminology for acceptance absolutely. for people. Yeah, for some people you're, you're absolutely right Harriet that the word acceptance, um, it has so many connotations there and it gets used in, in the medical field a lot that like this, like as if this is something that's no problem at all, I can do it, you know, you just need to accept the fact that you have this diagnosis and then move on and it, so it for for different clients for some clients they can they can hear that word and it is really not so triggering because it kind of you know but for others i think it my feeling is that it gets trivialized in the medical community sometimes um and so we i, I end up using another other words for people one of my clients used or several of my clients used the word that i can allow something to be and I let it be rather than that I accept it there. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to, to clarify what we actually mean by acceptance as well. Acceptance doesn't mean that I think it is good. 
that whatever it is has happened to me, in your case, say the cancer diagnosed that this is a good thing there and that I actually have to like it there. Um, it does also doesn't mean that it has to become good or so forth. Maybe some good may come out of it, who knows there, but there, there's oftentimes the experience much more that I, this is threatening to me, whatever it is. In this case, a cancer diagnosis is, is threatening there. And so we can, we can use and find other words that I allow it to be. This is a, a one that some of my clients have used. Or you can explore uh, other terms within kind of, with each client that may be a bit easier for them there. So I try and do both. I try and kind of clarify initially what we actually mean by acceptance and to kind of maybe disabuse them of some of the, the baggage that comes with that content. And then at the same time, then also offer a, a, a clarification of what I mean there by it. And to, to explore, perhaps there's a word that is more fitting for them there. The word is not so important. It's more the experience that we are looking for underneath that I can come to a place where I say, okay, I can, I can give my yes to simply the reality there, that it is there and I can let it be there. And if that's not the case as well, which is for many people initially, especially if they come in with anxiety, you get much more kind of different reactions that are protective reactions as well. I, I hinted at them a bit in the, in the abstract for this talk. Um, I don't have the time to go into them, but those are kind of psychodynamic, we call them coping reactions that come up when we feel threatened. Um, and so it may be an initial kind of avoidance or moving away from something. It can be kind of a paradoxical reaction where I engage too much, too much activity. Um, in the psychological literature, they've referred to some of these reactions as fight, fight, or freeze reactions which are reactions as well that are there that are protective for us. Um, and that may be initially what comes up, you know, and that's okay. And we can, with our attitude, with our engagements with our clients, if we can allow those to be what they are, rather than expecting people immediately to come to a place where they can accept, that too can provide some space for our clients rather than having to change those reactions immediately. Yeah. Well, I hope that was of, at least of, of a bit of help. That was very helpful. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, that's a, it's such a hard area to work in there. I've, I've worked with numerous patients as well who've had, who've had cancer, and it's, it's hard to come to that place there. And so we, we, we also don't want to overburden our clients or be it place a burden on them that they can have to come to something that they simply cannot do there that we need to allow them to be where they're at rather than necessarily having them expecting them to meet our expectations of where they should be there Absolutely. and I think existential Thank analysis is much more is actually quite client or person centered they're similar to a rogerian approach can you, can you say, I, I have too many messages in chat right now, Julia, to know uh, it's, exactly. It's from Anna. Uh, I yes. can uh, read the can question. Can you read it, please? Yes. If I can mm -hmm. feel that my yes and acceptance is not 100%, mm -hmm. however, I know what I need to take action now and what the situation uh, in general will be good. Is mm -hmm. it okay to act without 100 yes? <laughs> and yes. part, uh, particular, uh, my IVF uh, session is already a, a schedule, and I'm still working on 100% yes to kids, mm -hmm. but yeah. there is no more time to work on it. Mm. Need to act. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, that's <laughs> that's quite a question, Anna. So first of all, thank you for for asking it. Um, I would be, my initial response is one of uh, some hesitation in the sense that I, I certainly don't want to be telling you whether or not you should be going for IVF or not. <laughs> so I, I'll just back away from that. But maybe I'll take your question a little bit into a different direction, which is to say that, and this is a very common question that comes up in relation to actually inner consent, this idea of inner consent, and can I have half-hearted 
inner consent. So when I say, when I feel a yes, can it be kind of a half of a yes there? And this absolutely there is, that's the case where I feel like there, I am torn there. And there may be different values that are drawing me, drawing me towards saying yes to a possibility or saying no to it. Um, but if you have a sense that that is the case, you can give somewhat paradoxically a full yes to a half, half, half sense yes. In part because most of the time, in most situations, you, you can change later on as well. Now, um, you know, if, if this is something like that you're talking about, like IVF, you know, it's, mm, yeah, that, that may place some limitations on that. And saying yes to it has some pretty strong and profound implications there. <clears throat> but it's hard. So it would be, you know, yeah, it's hard for me to, to respond specifically there. But it may be worth looking at what is it that is saying a no within me. It may be that the no is coming from uh, a fear or it's the fear of the unknown. And so it can be helpful. And maybe this I'll use this as the transition into the next part, which is relating to the prerequisites for this inner yes, to look and to understand um, where that no is coming from. It may be like, you know, say in relation to an anxiety here, if I use myself as an example, I, I was not sure about doing this webinar. What would it be like? How is it going to relate? And so it brings up a bit of, un, feel a bit unsure in myself. But as I'm kind of going into it and as I'm trying it, I, I notice, oh no, I can do this. I have a sense that, oh, this, I can relate to people in this way. It has its limitations, of course, and it's not quite as good as I would like it in person. But I have the sense, and as I say yes to it, and as I kind of step out with some courage into uh, the, the situation, I realize, oh, I, I have more capacity, I'm able to do this, I become more aware of the situation there. And so I, it begins to change there as I move into it there. And that's the nice thing, I guess, about this idea of inner consent or the experience of inner consent really is that it is a dynamic thing, that it is changing, and that I can change with it. I can change in response to it there. So I'll perhaps leave it at that. I, uh, yeah, I, I hope that that was at least some help for you without necessarily telling you what to do in terms of proceeding there. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about these three prerequisites there. Um, and I, I'm realizing in terms of time, I'll have to do it fairly quickly. Um, but at least to give you a sense of what they are and then to introduce the idea of the case there or to introduce the case of it afterwards. So let's talk a bit about the prerequisites. Um, and the prerequisites are helpful here in, in our dealing with acceptance because we can look a bit at the parts of what, what is needed in order to come to an acceptance. And it, gives us direction, it gives us an area for us to work in, in relation to psychotherapy, but also in relation to life ourselves and dealing with, with our own situations. The first, first one of the prerequisites relates to protection. In German, we would use the word Schutz there, so that I, when we think about being, all being requires a certain amount of protection. There's no being there without protection in self. Um, if you think of the picture of a house, for example, you could think of the, the protection as the walls that surround that house, that make it possible for me to be here. Um, and we experience protection really in, in the experiences of ourselves being accepted in the past, in, in, in our current life as well. You know, so one of the questions you may consider is if, if, I'm, if I'm struggling or if in relation to a certain ex experience, do, do I have in my own life experiences of being accepted in the past? If I think about my childhood or if I think about my relationships right now, if I think about my work environment or 
the, my family environment, do I have experiences there where I feel myself accepted? Where people allow me to be who I am? Where I can be who I am with my good qualities, with my annoying qualities, with my whatever qualities that I have, but I have the sense that these people are there. They're with me. They accept me and they allow me to be who I am there. And this gives me a protection. Alfred uses the, the metaphor of like the protection is like a cloak that I wear around me that protects me against the elements that and, and relationships and, and experiences of acceptance in relationship uh, are one of those. But it doesn't just simply have to be in relationship there. If I, if I think about myself of being accepted in relation to myself, so where I have experiences of self-acceptance, where maybe not in the situation, the most challenging situation that I'm facing right now, but where I can think about myself and my own history and my biography, do I have, have I had opportunities where I accept myself, where I have stepped out and allowed myself to be who I am, where I can say yes to myself, even in light of my limitations. There. I may experience this also in other places. A lot of my clients speak about their experience of being accepted within nature there, where they feel at home in nature, where they feel uh, at home in relation to animals or pets, for example. Pets are a fantastic example uh, of, of really unconditional acceptance there um, by thinking of my sister and she just has a relatively new dog and this dog is so happy and excited to see me and accepts me just as i am without any demands really on who i should be there many of many of my clients who have support animals who are with them dogs especially but also others experience this experience of being accepted there and so the more I have, kind of as a general rule, the more that I have experiences in my life where I feel accepted um, by others in relationship, by animals, by nature, by myself, the more I have those experiences, the more I can draw upon them to, uh, as a place, as a way of protection there. And the more that I may then actually be able to extend that acceptance to a situation that is particularly challenging there. So that may be then a question for you or for your clients to consider what are those, those places, those experiences of where I have had acceptance that may protect me then and they may offer protection for me there. And just as a brief aside, I don't want to get into it too much, this also shows, by the way, the, the limitations of that. So if I, if I am in relationship that relationships that are abusive, where there is a profound experience that I cannot be here, therapeutically, our job is not to kind of shore up experiences of acceptance there. But if there's clear examples where that's not the case, where there is not that protection within relationship, where there's aggression or even violence in relationship, we may join the client in finding uh, places where they can be protected as well, where they can be accepted who they are, as they are. Yeah. So I just want to say that as an aside, there, there are some situations where I think we want to work and, and assist in a different direction there to find a place where they can be accepted. So that's the first one of, of protection there. The second prerequisite uh, from from existential analysis is that of space. Um, the, the, having space and being able to take up space within myself and in my environment is kind of this primordial experience of freedom that I can take up space, I can have enough space in my life where I am not threatened. There. When you look at people and you talk to people who experience threat and experience anxiety, almost invariably you hear them talk about closeness and narrowness, the experience of being trapped, of finding no way out, of, of, of tightness there. Uh, you see this often with anxiety and anxiety disorders 
where there is a sense that I am, as things are closing in and they're too tight within me. Um, and uh, so having space, having enough space within my body, having enough sense that I can actually take up space in the room, within my relationships, you know, they, where I have the sense that other people say, yes, this is good that you are here, that you can be part of us and take up space here too. This also contributes to my capacity for acceptance there. So it relates to a few different areas that we can't touch on. It relates to my relationships, to my body. The experience of space is, is connected to the experience of breath, of being able to breathe freely there. And we know that when we are not accepted, when we, have, when we are anxious and it's tight, breathing becomes difficult. It relates to my physical space, the space that I take up in my life, the space that I have in my home, in my community, where I have the experience of that it is good that I am here, that I, that I belong somewhere. And so the theme of being at home emotionally, relationally, physically is a theme that comes up at this point. Yeah. The question may come then, how do we gain space? If, if, if part of my struggle is that I lack space in my life, how do I gain space? Well, we, we gain space in some ways by distancing there, by self-distancing there. So that may happen through things like reflection. When I take time to reflect on my situation, I stand back from my situation and I look at it and I see what, I, what comes to me because of the situation there. I take space through breathing, through breathing more deeply you know, and so this connects to all of the breath work that can be done with clients to be able to take more space in relation to my own body. Um, distancing or, or, or gaining space can also come as a result of actually looking at what is threatening to me. Um, oftentimes when we have things that are threatening to us, our initial reaction is immediately to turn away from whatever is threatening. And so we miss out on information. We don't perceive perhaps accurately what is there. So being able to kind of stay and remain with what is there and to, um, and to look at it precisely, to take my time with it, also provides a bit of space. It can, be hap it can happen also in dialogue, in, in dialogue with our friends or our family, in dialogue with our partner, in dialogue with, with a therapist that this can be a way of gaining space there in talking about it. I can, I can gain space through time, horizontally, so to speak, over time, that as I sleep on something, this too allows me a bit more space, that I take, I gain space away from it. Um, or, or from a new perspective, and gaining a new perspective at the situation or of the situation, this too is a way of gaining a bit of distance and space so that I have the sense that whatever it is that is threatening to me, I have a bit more room to be who I am, to be myself, and to see and look at the situation accurately there. And so, again, these are all areas in which we may help clients through small experiences of being able to take up space in their life more and gain space in their life to then eventually help them also with whatever is too threatening, is too close, is too menacing for them in whatever situation they cannot gain acceptance. And similarly, the more I have the sense that I have space in my life and I can take up space, the easier it will be for me to do that as well in relation to whatever situation is hard for me to accept. The last one here that I want to touch on briefly is the experience of ground or of support. And so and if we stay with the, the picture of, of the house, that the, the protection is like the walls around it, the space within it is the, the space or the room within it is the space that I can take up. And then we have a ground as well. So this becomes the third prerequisite for us, that if I want to accept something, I need the experience of that I can actually stand on something, that I have, in German we use the word halt, that something holds me, that, that 
gives me a hold that I can stand there so that I have the experience of being supported, of being held, that there is something that's firm and, and predictable and something that I can count on in my life, something that I can trust there. If we look at what gives us support, we can look at it in four different areas. There's, there's many more, but I just mentioned four. We may experience the ground of our being through our relationship to being itself, through the order that is as part of being, through the structure in life, through the fact that there's regularities that I can count on, that if I cut myself, for example, that that begins to heal by itself, that I don't have to do anything there, but that I can begin to trust in that through tradition and many other things that where I can sense that I, I, that being itself is in some ways for me, is on my side, is with me, and it provides some structure and some hold for me. I experience the experience of, of being held within relationships. This is what one of the things, the primary things that happens within psychotherapy, that I am with someone and someone is with me and that this person is accepting me and holding me and is not pushed over or, or you know, decentered by my being, that they have enough space and enough support to hold me, that I feel held within psychotherapy. And so this can happen, this experience of being held can happen within people, in people, in relationships with animals, again, in my home, in my culture, in my history, in all of these areas where I feel in relationship that I can, I'm being held here. It can happen in relation to myself. As I gain more abilities and I, as I can stand with myself, I can provide some ground and some hold, from, some support for myself as well, that I am standing with myself and loyal to myself. It can also happen at a spiritual level, at the level of meaning, where I have a sense of hope and of faith, that I, that I trust in certain spiritual realities. Tillich talked about God, the experience of God, as the experience of the ground of being. That I sense that after everything, there is still something that holds me in this world. There. And so for some of us, this may be that experience, that there is a ground of being that goes beyond relationships. But even it does not that have to be there. It can be within myself, in relationships, and in this being in the world. And so as a summary, then perhaps of these three, the acceptance really is the accept experience of I can be here. That whatever is threatening to me, I have enough capacity within myself. I have enough protection of my being, enough hold and enough ground and support in my being, enough space for me to be that I can allow whatever it is that is threatening to me to be there too, that I can give my yes to it. And it's really this primordial reality or this primordial ability to say, yes, I can be here with whatever it is that is there. And I can allow it to be there. I can give my inner consent, my inner yes, to letting it be there. there. So that's probably the, the, my, my attempt to summarize this at this point. Um, I don't know if there are, are questions right now. Perhaps this wouldn't be a bad time just to, to take a few questions. And if you have questions perhaps about what I've said so far or about the prerequisites that we have talked about for, for acceptance there. So I'll just be quiet for a minute and see if there's anybody who would like to talk or has a question about what I've said. Yeah, uh, Julia. Yes, there is, there's a question uh, on our chat. Uh, how to distinguish the fear of action from the actual acceptance uh, of the situation and stopping attempts. I'm sorry, could you just read the beginning of that question once more, Julia? How to distinction, how, how to distinguish the distinguish, fair. Yeah. Distinguish the fair, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. So how to distinguish what? The fair of action from the actual acceptance of the situation and yeah. stop 
stopping attempts. Okay. Yeah. How to distinguish the fear? Is that what fear. I mean? Yes. The fear. The fear. 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 Yes. Yeah. From what? Of action. The fear. fear of action. Of action. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very good question because uh, I guess what I'm hearing you say, who, whoever is asking this question is, how do I know that it's not just simply about me being afraid, right? That, that it, if I were to step into the situation, that fear would disappear. And that's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to know. Uh, is the fear realistic? <laughs> you know, um, and sometimes we don't know that. We don't know that. This is a, it's a, a question that I face a lot with my clients where we begin to talk and think and talk about where, where does this fear come from? Because a fear can be very realistic. If I see a bear running towards me, I should be afraid. And the fear helps me, actually. So I don't need to accept the bear. I, I need to get myself out of there as a way of protecting myself and so that's kind of an extreme example that perhaps a very canadian example here we do have bears all over the place where we live there but um it is a question of of kind of the realism of fear the realism of fear um and if i'm if am i really is this is this something that is that i need to take into consideration as well so in my experience, it's something that, that can help come through reflection and can help come especially also through dialogue. Fear lives really on the basis of my fantasy as well. And so the question of whether or not something is realistic is, is a very, very crucial uh, question for fear there. Um, but I can, you can begin still with a little bit of acceptance, which is to say to accept the fact that you are afraid right now and to take this seriously and rather than necessarily to remove the fear immediately and get rid of it but to ask what it is about and to try and understand it this too is kind of an accepting kind of understanding attitude towards whatever it is that comes within us um, and it's probably good to 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 step into dialogue with ourselves and to and perhaps to dialogue with others about it, if I don't really know so much whether or not this is realistic. There. Yeah. Any other questions at this point? Uh, again, me. I'm sorry, we have another question. In no, our no, don't apologize. It's this is what I'm asking for. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, could you say a bit more? about the difference between protection and grounding. Not mm -hmm. sure I fully understand. How, how to understand that. Yeah, what, what, I, what I mean with grounding, they're, they're, they're very related to each other as well. So that's, it's not a big surprise there. Um, what I'm talking about with, ex, with protection is, relates more to the experience of either being accepted, of having prior experiences of acceptance, by other people, by myself, by my environment, where I have had the experience that this allows me to be and lets me be and gives me acceptance there. And that these small experiences of, experience, uh, of acceptance, this kind of store of, of history, of my own biography, of being accepted, allows me to experience protection, feeling protected within. Um, and that I carry that protection within myself there, that I step into situations and, and I kind of presume that that is the case. So you can see, you can see that. Whereas when I talk about, when we're talking about ground there, we're talking more of the sense of, um, of it does relate as well to relationships. It may come up in relationships as well, but in ground, I also look towards other experiences that give me some solidity, that give me the experience of, in some ways, resistance as well, right? Alfred said once in, in our training that there is no security in life, there's no safety in life without some kind of resistance that is there. That if I take the chair, my experience, for example, of sitting in this chair, I 
I need the, the resistance of the structure of the chair to give me the experience of being held there. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit different than of, of that of protection. It's more the sense that there's something that is underneath me that is holding and supporting me there. And it may be through different areas, through, through regularities in my life, through structure in my life, through traditions and so forth over time that give me that experience that I'm being held there. So I'm, I'm hoping that that differentiates it a little bit for you there. You're, you're absolutely right and that they are, they are closely related there, which is one of the reasons why they come up at this point. Good. Well, maybe just in view of the time, we're already a bit, you know, a bit over. I'll, I'll kind of present my case, present the case of this client of mine, and I'll tell you a little bit about Mary, about this client, and about how she came to therapy. Um, and then maybe I'll, what I would like to do is invite a little bit more participation on your end to imagine yourself as being the therapist rather than me going through and presenting the case and presenting how the therapy went. But maybe we can think a little bit about uh, ways that you would perhaps want to uh, use or want to, well, use is not the right word, but th that you would want to engage with Mary around the theme of acceptance there. So let me just tell you a little bit about her. So Mary is a 69-year-old woman who came to me in the context of, of psychotherapy after a, uh, a car accident there. Um, Mary was driving one sun, sun, <laughs> sunny, warm British Columbia day along a highway here, a kind of a two-lane, no, not a divided highway, just, just where there's traffic that's oncoming there. She was enjoying herself. She was whistling a nice tune as she was driving along that highway. And all of a sudden, there was, a, she, she tells this a bit more through the, the realm of other people because she, she, has, she lost consciousness there. But uh, suddenly, there was a, a, a truck, kind of a, what we would call a cube truck here, kind of a, a moderately sized truck that crossed the center line there. And uh, she was, you know, it was so nice and warm, she had her window down and had her arm on the armrest. And as that truck passed by and, and then impacted her vehicle, she was hit in the head by the mirror of that truck. It knocked her unconscious briefly. She, she uh, kind of the, the, was able to pull the vehicle to the side, um, had a bit of loss of consciousness there, sustained some uh, orthopedic injuries to her face, some, some challenges with her eyesight afterwards. But the most difficult part of it for us in our therapy that we began to work on was the, the traumatic brain injury that she just sustained there. Or we would call it a mild to moderate traumatic brain injury. Some people will speak about it as a concussion as well. Um, and she experienced a variety of different kind of concussive symptoms that came as a result of it. it very and if you work with people who have had injuries like that, these are fairly common. There, um, she experienced a fair bit of low energy. She was prior to this. She was even though she was sixty nine, she loved working and she had moved kind of from a full time. Or maybe I'll talk a little bit about her, her work history. Moved from a full time job to a consultant job for the for the the local government here and was traveling all over the place as a consultant there, was working just because she could and she wanted to, was working you know, five or six days a week uh, on projects and actually loved, absolutely loved her job, was not interested in retiring, even though she could have easily retired at this age, but wasn't interested in doing so because she loved her work so much, um, was an active, uh, socially active, but also then physically active and active in her work life person. So she sustains this work injury or this, this, this injury uh, during a car accident, is never able to go back to work, sustains a, a concussion, has low energy. She has cognitive problems that come as a result of the concussion. These include things like problems with short-term memory, um, problems with attention and sustaining attention. She starts activities 
Um, and then she kind of gets distracted and moves on to the next thing and forgets about the previous activity. There, so her house became full of kind of little projects that she started that she never was able to complete. She gets distracted easily. She struggles with multitasking. She loves cooking, um, some things that she did for, for many, many years in her life, and struggles with being able to multitask, doing all the same things at the, time, at the right time and at the same time that need to happen when she is cooking there. And her, her overall, her cognitive processing is slower there. She also experiences a variety of emotional and psychological symptoms. She's struggling to adjust. She can't really understand and really accept at all the reality of this life, of this life now with a traumatic brain injury. Um, she experiences symptoms of generalized anxiety. There, there are some symptoms of panic attacks that come throughout her day. There, she's kind of got a low mood, a, a depressive mood there. There's some minor traumatic anxiety, but we don't have kind of the, there's not the sense that they were dealing with PTSD here. There's some anxiety on the road. The most challenging thing for her is the fact that she really struggles, and this becomes the kind of the focus of our psychotherapy. She struggles to adjust to a life with, um, with a brain injury. And so she often kind of lives her life uh, in ways that, um, <laughs> as if she was trying to live without a brain injury there. So, and you see kind of with clients like this, this characteristic kind of up and down sort of, you know, where she has some energy, she just goes for it, you know, no matter what her limitations are. And then she crashes and she has the experience of several days in bed and she has no energy at all. And so she has this kind of up and down sort of pattern there. She has some struggles relationally. She's divorced. She's remarried. Um, the, the man that she's remarried in her 60s is a, is a lovely person, but struggles with empathizing, struggles with understanding her. So he tries to support her as much as he can, but really doesn't understand her that much. Um, the same thing is true for her for her, her daughters. She has three daughters with whom she relates and all of them also struggle to accept and allow her to be who she is. Um, there's conflict there. They don't really understand her. They're, they have high expectations of what she should do as the, as the mother and grandmother in the relationship there. So as a in kind of in summary is we have somebody here in Mary who has had a change, a sudden change, who really is struggling to accept and to understand her reality, who says to me in session, I simply, I cannot accept this. This cannot be that I have this concussion there, um, who struggles to pace her activity levels and there and has this kind of pattern of up and down, too much activity and then no activity there. So the, the question that came for me as I was kind of preparing this case then for you was then, how could we, if we think about what acceptance is and on the basis of what we've talked about already, how could we help Mary? What would you be interested in doing? What would you be able to do? What may be a first step that you would do if, you, if Mary came to see you in psychotherapy? Or if you're not a psychotherapist, if Mary was your friend, simply coming to you and telling you about her situation there. So. I'll invite maybe some, some responses to you, and I can tell you a bit about uh, some of my thoughts as well, but I thought maybe this could be an opportunity for you to engage a bit at this point. Okay, I just, yeah. Anybody who would like to say something, and maybe Julia, if you want to give us perhaps some, some of the comments again, that was really helpful if they are coming up. We have one uh, participant who couldn't use microphone. Yes. Could you please check? Uh, is anyone? Uh, yeah, oh, if there's somebody who's not not in there, yes, I will check. Oh, I am sorry. There's been more people who've joined. My my apologies to all of you who are not able to talk. I will try my very best. So I think. Oh yeah. It's the only one again, sorry, Stephanie is the only one I can't allow because she's 
working with an older version of the software, but I think everybody now should be able to talk there. So yeah, please. Mary doesn't feel understood, so. <laughs> Hello, Susanna. Hi there. <laughs> Hi. Hey, welcome, welcome. Thank you for, for participating. Please, please go ahead. Well, I see the problem with Mary. She doesn't feel understood. She has no, um, she doesn't feel accepted. Um, there is no sense of uh, community. Um, socially, it's very difficult. So what could be a proposal is for Mary to find people who understand her or are in a similar situation yeah. so that she can strive to happen and maybe make something, find meaning in her condition. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very, very helpful response. Susanna, and in fact, that's, I didn't even go into some of her social situation, but kind of, she, she had withdrawn a lot. Mary had withdrawn a lot from relationships there. The relationship with her partner, with her husband, was a supportive one, generally speaking, but he really didn't understand what we were dealing with when we were dealing with a traumatic brain injury. Um, and, and neither did Mary, for that matter. There, you know, she had managed to come through all of these all of these various different healthcare providers and not really understood what she was dealing with. And so where we began with Mary at the beginning was some, with some psych, what we would call psychoeducation, which is just beginning to tell her what is a brain injury um, and what, what can be expected of it. And so that she can begin to understand it, right? Um, which is not so easy, by the way, with somebody where you, the, the challenge is cognitive. There are cognitive challenges. And so to help them understand about that. But then also to look absolutely, to look at her life, to look at her relationship with her partner who didn't understand and, and tried to be supportive, but really struggled with support there. Struggled to accept her, struggled to say, you know, to adjust her life to adjust, to allow her, she, for example, she was expected and, and she just took this as part of life that she would cook for him every day. This was part of the expectations of life. And so we began to look at that and to say, could we allow for some or, or make space for some differences from, you know, if we really take this concussion seriously and we allow it not just to be kind of the reality out there, but a lived reality for her, what are the consequences of doing that there? And so we, we, the work with the partner became a very significant part of that. And then also the work with other people where there are, where there are experiences where she could go and simply be who she was in those relationships where they didn't have to have, uh, where she didn't have to perform to a certain extent there and so we we found a, a so local support group that was immensely helpful for her as well and it, it some of that could come out in in therapy as well where we could allow her to be in therapy who she was but it was i found it was very helpful also for her to have examples and experiences of other people in their lives who had been perhaps a bit further down the road in terms of their their adjustment to uh living with a brain injury yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Susanna. Anybody else who would want to say something at this point? I'm guessing, um, I'm wondering whether if she doesn't have many examples of to draw upon for protection of in her current life um, mm. about times when she's been accepted um, that it would be really important for you to provide that for her and um, possibly that you felt quite a sense of responsibility mm -hmm. um, that you could provide like a really holding um, space for her where you accepted her no matter what. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That became kind of a very key thing. We, we actually developed a wonderful rapport and a wonderful relationship there. And so one of the things that I was interested in doing and wanted to do is to, to get to know her, to know her not just simply through her symptoms as kind of a, a somebody in general, but to get to know her specifically of a person, of who she is. And she turned out to be a very wonderful, interesting, fascinating person, and someone's very unique. Um, she had this 
kind of very conservative side of her. She is a, a, of, a of a religious uh, kind of person. And on the other hand, she had this kind of wild, crazy, like her favorite band was ACDC, which you don't find very much in 69 year old people there. <laughs> and so we were able to kind of explore that and discover that and she could become really who she was more so in our in our therapy there and so that was certainly my aim was to to know her to know her personally and to offer her an experience of of a lack of pressure a lack of kind of conditions that you have to live up to in order for you to be okay but for me and it with her you know with some clients it can be more challenging with her it was really not challenging at all just because she happened to be such a lovely person there um, and so that was something I think that we were able to provide in our therapy with her. No, thank you very much. Any other comments? I see someone, sorry, just here uh, making the suggestion. I would tell Mary how beautiful uh, it is that she survived there. Yeah, that's a wonderful suggestion. And in, I, I, didn't quite make that in this, quite like this, but I, I, one of the things, and I think it relates maybe a bit to the comment I made before, I, and this is, I think, something that is, is beautiful about existential analysis in that I become personally involved, not, not in terms of crossing boundaries or disclosing private information, but that existential analysis encourages us to be there as persons. And to move out of simply taking on a role of a psychotherapist, but to actually be personally present there. And so I had, you know, I got to know her as a person and could uh, talk about my gratitude for our, our encounter, for our, the possibility of getting to know her, that my life as a therapist can become richer and become more fulfilling. Um, through my work with her and through my engagement with her. You know, not that, you know, that this becomes something where I am having needs fulfilled, but there is something true and real when we allow our clients to, to move out of the role of just being a client and they become a person to us there. And so that was certainly true also in the relationship. So that was a very helpful comment. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if you can hear it, me. It's yes, Jen here. Yes, I hear you, Barbara. Very loud and clear. Wonderful. Hello there. Having done some work with clients with acquired injuries in the past, part of my work is around um, exploring meanings for them, as mm. in what does the word disability mean? What does that word concussion in Mary's case, what does it mean to them? You know, what would it have meant prior to the injury and what subsequently? Um, which can be a help path to help looking at what those blocks to acceptance might be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so when we're dealing with acceptance, we, you're absolutely right. We deal with kind of understanding and our, with our perception. And it may be that we have a, a misperception of what that is, of yeah. what disability is or what, what uh, um, uh, a, a traumatic brain injury is. So absolutely, you're right. To look at that and to look at what is it that we understand, what is the unique meaning that she understands from it, what it means to her, and what it also means to other people in her life, in her family, and so forth. So yeah, absolutely. Very, very helpful. This was certainly something we did this kind of at the beginning, but it is something that kind of came back throughout our therapy repeatedly, and something, a meaning that began to change for her. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Is there anybody else who would want to make a comment? I see a little bit, just looking, I see a list of our attendees here. And I see that we're kind of dropping off there. And I'm also aware of the time and that I had promised to kind of go for about an hour. And I, we're unfortunately kind of, well, unfortunately or not, we are at an hour and a half now past that. So I'm wondering if this would maybe be an okay time to, to kind of bring this, bring our time to a close here. Um, yeah, so it, I, I wanted to say a, a, a brief thank you to everybody to, who was here, who kind of stuck with us 
uh, even in spite of the fact that I went over in time. Um, and uh, to, to all of you who, who engaged, um, for those of you especially who, who spoke, thank you for, for doing that. I know it takes courage to do that in a situation where we don't necessarily always know and we, we, we can't see each other here. And so you kind of speak into the void and it takes a bit of courage to do that. So thank you for doing that. Thank you to all of you who are here and who are perhaps like, I think it was Natalia who was staying up late, perhaps those who are in Moscow or in other places. Thank you for, for your involvement here and for your interest in existential analysis. Um, I do hope it is something that will be, that you will consider, uh, for those of you who are able to do it, participating in the training there. It was a very, very meaningful and it remains a very, very meaningful connection for me in my life. And I hope that it will be something for you that also will be beneficial. So thank you. The last thank you goes then to, to uh, Julia and to the GLE in the UK for making this possible. Um, thanks for setting this up and for, for all of your patience in terms of the, the connection and the, the, the um, technology, technological piece here. So thank you very much, Julia. There. Uh, thank you, Derek. It was an uh, amazing webinar and thank you for all this information. And I just want to ask a few words uh, from me. I'm a student of uh, Alfred Langley as well. Mm -hmm. We already have a um, um, group uh educational group in london yeah, yeah. and we now we're trying to uh, make uh, another one group yeah. uh, english speaking group in yeah. london and it will start on 29th of may i hope mm -hmm. that some of you could uh, join this group uh, you can ask me any questions you want um i will write my email uh to to our chat Mm -hmm. or you have all information in our website uh, so feel free to connect with me mm -hmm. or with my colleagues uh, we will uh, tell you um, a lot about this education and from our experience as well not only as organizers thank yeah. you Derek very much it was yeah. very, very helpful thank you for your time and for yeah. your messages Thank you all. Thank you all. And a good evening to all of you wherever, wherever you are. Okay.